Hello, I'm Paul Stankard at Salem Community College's Samuel H. Jones Glass Education Center, where we hold the annual International Frameworking Conference. Since 2001, master artists from around the globe have demonstrated their talent here in the spirit of sharing with our students and conference attendees. We've recorded these demonstrations so students and glass enthusiasts can be inspired by these featured artists. This collection of video demonstrations is now being offered to you through Salem Community College's exclusive master's series. Kari Russell Poole's work transforms patterns from the ordinary into the extraordinary. Curry employs a lush botanical framework vocabulary to create forms that stimulates the viewer through its beauty. Yet, it is identifiable as a functional object. She has used teapots, vases, and quilts as her inspiration. Her work is held in collections across the nation, including the Corning Museum of Glass, the Tucson Museum of Art, the Smithsonian Institute of American Art, and the Museum of American Craft in Millville, New Jersey. I invite you to watch as Corey Russell Poole demonstrates at the 2003 International Flameworking Conference. I've started with a base cane of yellow, and I've rolled through some pinks over the top. And I generally like to use a second, a different color underneath because you get a nice um, watercolor effect as the colors bleed through. So anyway, this is, for me, a really tough crowd to demonstrate in front of because obviously, as you see me trying to make a little ball of glass, it's really not about technique for me. It's about what I get in the end. So I'm very conscious of the fact that I know that my hands should probably work, be working in unison, and I should have a nice little ball. And, and you know, I, I can't do that. I know just enough to get by. So I'll make basically petal stock, where I'll color it, and then I'll, I'll pull out a long piece. And for me, I prefer to stay on one task all day long, because I find that um, you, f you fall into a groove. And so your last hour may be more productive than your first three, because your hands just fall into such a, a pattern. I lay my pieces out on a piece of kale wool, which I tend not to move around much just because, again, I think the safety factor on that probably isn't great. Yeah, these little pieces are so little that they can just um, cool down, and the blanket keeps them, warms them up. I mean, it's it's all... When I started, I used to have to slip them inside of a piece of blanket. And now I seem to be OK just laying them on top. I'm putting them onto a little piece of. Oh, yeah, I just I clean off the ends. The question was what I'm what is it that I'm throwing down into the bucket here? So I'm using a surface mix torch because I my color's right on the because I'm rolling through the powders, I found that if I have a premixed torch I get a lot of distortion in the color and reduction.
my hand torch as well is a surface mix. Although I do use a little, um, I think it's a national, to go back and hit the back side of my seams and in tight spots, and that's a pre-mix. And I try not to hit too much color with that. are my homemade squashing tools, which aren't very pretty, but because they're copper, they have a lot of give, so you can't over squeeze and make things too thin. So I'm just going to make a couple of flowers, sort of like the flowers on this bowl. I think I've got enough petals, so I'm going to make the center black now. Because I want it to be black, and I don't have any black cane, and I want it opaque as well. So if I pulled this out, it would be really translucent by the time it got clear or thin. So this is just the blue here. And the, it's really a faint layer of color, so it's pretty much disappeared by the time I pull it out. There's so much that we have to do that, you know, I can't imagine melting my own colors and then fritting and powdering them. I tried a little bit of ball milling. We used to, at school, we'd be able to melt tanks of colors and I tried um, making my own powder and frit, but you have to be really careful about, I, we had like a ceramic ball mill and you'd put a certain amount of the ceramic material into the glass as it was um, ground, and that then we'd experience color and fitting problems with that. So, and our friend Rob Levin suffer, suffered a lot of health problems from melting his own colors, and I really, that's just something to, that I've never felt the need to. To do, and that we're really fortunate now to have such a variety available. So this is the back of the flower. Um, you know, in school we used Louis glass, which was a colored glass. The question was, have I used any other glasses? And right now, um, we've toyed with the idea of, you know, a lot of people are having success with the gaffer cullet. But at this point, I have so much work out there, and I do get work back for repair on occasion. And I think just the cataloging system that I'd have to do if I got work back as to which glass I needed to repair would be, um, a logistics nightmare at this point. I mean, I know that I could organize myself in such a way that it wouldn't be a problem, but at this point in my life, I don't think I could. So we're going to stick with what we have. And I try not, you know, Mark's been making some um, beads and marbles and stuff, so he's been playing around with Moretti. 
And even that, it's just, you know, we're not the neatest people in the world, but it necessitates a whole level of consciousness of making sure that you don't have anything on the desk that can be mixed, because God knows what your fitting problems are going to be. So I just prefer to stay with the one glass. Okay, so I've put this little swirl of um, black on it. I'm just going to start adding the petals. So when I'm adding petals, I always work from the inside out. Now, if, some, if I were to break this, I know that there's people that can bring them up slowly and repair. To me, it's just not worth it. I just pitch the whole thing and, and start again. Because I get a lot of this popping and snapping, that's why we keep the kids sort of behind the gate away. And I get to this point, and this is about the point when somebody would have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I asked them. Our older daughter was really good about, she never threw anything, but our younger daughter finds that she can get some attention by throwing toys out the thing. I said, we do not throw toys in the studio. What would mommy say if you broke some of her glass? She looked right at me and she'd say, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> like, ugh, Lord. <laughs> the only three-year-old that's swearing in preschool. So anything larger, I just throw right in the annealer. Okay. You know, I forgot to ask, so it's just, um, right now it's about 900. I'm, I'm really careful. The way I was taught to um, determine annealing was you take your cane, and if it moves a quarter of an inch over an hour in the oven, then that's your slump temperature, and you subtract 40 from that. And um, so I will, I will take my colored cane, different lengths, I will put it in the oven, and I will do careful tests and recalibrate my oven every few months. And so, but my part oven, I just think it needs to cool. I'm not 
it, everything gets re-annealed or annealed a bunch of times. So I'd make the frame, put the frame together, and then I'd anneal that, and then I'd start putting the parts on it, and then I'd anneal it, and then I, I check everything, because there'll be cracks that will happen from putting stress in the glass, and then I'll repair them and then re-anneal it. So the work gets, those parts will all be re-annealed. So I don't think, if I'm off on that, I don't think it'll be tragic. start in a cold oven and then bring them up slowly. Usually um, five hours I think is good but the, recently we had was making um, the cupcake orb chalices and they we were having the, the bits were breaking off the bird and we think that um, we were just bringing those up too fast for the amount of glass that was there so uh, for those, I've been really extending the schedule, bringing them up very slowly. And also, um, Mark had learned from another lamp worker how to use a tungsten rod to bore holes and things. So he puts little holes in all his birds under the wing so that there's, before when it, they were sealed off, you could go back into the glory hole and they would either expand or contract because of the pressure in there. So if you put a little hole in there, they stay constant pressure. And, um, and usually we remember that when the punnies come off the birds, they have to have a little bit of wax to cover that hole so they don't get water in. But occasionally you get a little water into those pieces and so there's really no, you have to just bring them up at a crawl because once the steam will go it'll crack the blown pieces. So I'm just going to make a blackberry and I'm making the little petals to go in the back. I can't remember, did I use my scissors to cut that? Okay, um, the reason I do that is, it didn't look like it did much here, but um, when you cut it and make an impression like that in the powder, it doubles up where they join. So in the end, oh there it's going, there's a nice green line down the center of the leaf. Feels really awkward, but it feels worse looking down. No, I have an adjustable chair that goes down really low. And I probably adjust my chair as much as I adjust my torch. So I made these little things earlier, rolling through the black, used blue as a base and rolled through the black powder and actually put a little transparent violet over the top, not because it adds any color, but the black's really prone to reducing. So if you can add something over the top that you don't really see, cuts down the reduction. And just pulled these out and worked them out into these little blackberry dupers. So 
So I get things moving pretty well and then go and push them into shape. The question was, how old was I when I realized I was an artistic person? Um, I'd say I was pretty young. I used to like to take clay classes and, and um, you know, I won a couple poster contests when I was really little. And I think people label you. By the time I got to junior high school and high school, I was really pretty serious. I'd, I won a t-shirt competition that got me a scholarship to go to um, the Rhode Island School of Design for a summer session. And that was pretty neat, being a kid and, and being on the RISD campus for the summer. And I, I knew after that that that's what I wanted to do. But even still, I wanted to be an illustrator. I was going to be something nice and safe that I could make a living at. You know, I'd been doing a lot of two-dimensional work, print and painting, and it, I'm, I'm not good. I'm not, not great on the follow-through. So what is wonderful with glass is that when I've got a flower finished, it is colored, it is ready to go, and um, I just throw that. I'm working. I'm at every step of the way. The piece has achieved. I've finished a step that. If I had to finish that after the fact, I know it would be really difficult for me to, to cross that threshold and finish. So it's sort of an immediate process in a way for me. I'm just going to make a couple leaves so you can see. Um, I have one leaf making tool, and it's pretty versatile. I'm able to make a lot of different things with this one tool. Yep. I love these things. They used to be in coffee cans, but these are so, so nice. And if you burn the bottom, you just throw them out and get another one. Rarely, usually, um, like if it's a really, it's a summery, springy piece, I probably made it in the winter. And I seem to be like whatever I'm fixating on at that time. The only thing that I brought in to actually, um, is the honeysuckle. I did bring some of that in to look and try. And I did try making it just the way the honeysuckle is with the right number of petals and it didn't and then I tried making it the way I ended up making it in the thing and it my honeysuckle looked more real in glass than trying to make the real honeysuckle it gave a better impression as well So I can use the tool to smash the impression in, and then if I use the flattener tool and take out most of the indentations, because I've put that impression into the powder on the surface, the, the lines will still stay in there. No, this, um, this is a Jim Moore tool. I, I bought it when I took that class in Pilchuck, which was late 80s. So he, he's changed the design a little bit, um, but just the standard Jim Moore tool. Yeah. 
So this is what you're left with when you do your first smash. And you can manipulate this in any way. That the edge will still stay as you pull it out. You can um, manipulate it again. I sometimes wish that I'd gotten one of those counters that they use for crowds when I first started making pieces, because I'm kind of curious how many leaves I've made in my life. It would be kind of fun just to have a little. OK, blackberry dupers was the question. Using impeccable technique, I get a really, I get a ball, and I roll through the black. Then I'll use a little of this transparent that's going to disappear, but just keep the black from reducing on me. I'll just pull them off one by one. I find it's better to, um, after you pull it, go ahead and use it all up instead of making a bunch of stock and then going back later. And sometimes you'll have trouble with uh, them cracking. That's how that's done. This is, um, it's called the SGO, but it's a Bethlehem torch, but I think they changed it. I think it's called the PME now. And um, I was just looking at it. I might get a new one. It's a little thinner. It's one thing now. They, they've changed some things. It's really comfortable to me. I, the way, um, I think it's unusual that the gas is on the top and the oxygen. But I like that I can use this torch. I don't even think. I don't even know what the controls are. If you told me, describe your torch, I couldn't tell you what it is. But once it's in my hand, then my fingers just adjust it. And it's a very comfortable torch for me. So um, generally, when I'm attaching, I keep things higher and then higher still. So I work at the bottom 
the thing that I've, the one big lesson that I will impart to you that I've learned all these years is heat rises. And I know we all know that, but if you're working on something, it just makes a lot of sense to work in a methodical way. So you're working lower um, from the bottom to the top. What's it? Do I warm the frame at all? Um, sometimes I have to kneel before I get to that stage, or I'll have cracking. But um, no, just go right at it. So thank you.